Well, if you have your Bible, please turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. The book of 1 Samuel, and we're in chapter 1 this morning. We're closing out chapter 1 this morning, this last section of this first chapter. And much of the chapter, has, as we already noted, is concerning an Israelite woman by the name of Hannah. In the opening verses, we learned about her home life and especially about her desire to have a son. Most of us are very familiar with the story of Hannah, and we'll recall that she um, desired to have a son but was barren. So Hannah, rather than becoming bitter and rather than um, running away from the Lord, runs to the Lord and goes to the Lord seeking uh, him. She spends time in his presence, pours herself out, Uh, The Scripture speaks about her pouring her soul out before the Lord. Uh, She lays her burden before the Lord, and she asks the Lord for a son. And God responds to her request. And so Hannah conceives. That's where we last left off, and she gives birth to a son, which brings us to the passage that we're at this morning, beginning in verse number 21. So let's read it again. Then the man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull. And brought the boy to Eli. She said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed. And the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, uh, we are thankful for your word. And we uh, are thankful for this account that reminds us that you hear the pleas of your people, that you are very much aware and it pleases you when we pray to you. And I pray, Lord, that we would pray in faith. And that even as we observe the prayer of Hannah, that we would be faithful to fulfill whatever we promise or whatever we vow to the Lord. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's where I want to go this morning. I want us to look at this passage, and I want to talk about Hannah and her offering to the Lord, her vow being fulfilled. And as we look at this, I just want to walk through this passage and, and, and look, about, look at uh, uh, how she has um, fulfilled the vow that she has made. You know, as I was thinking about this, I, I don't know if you go there. It certainly happens to own vows to the Lord like this. I start thinking about my own life and my, and my own vows to the Lord. And I, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to tell you about some of those vows that I've made over the years, but I think we've all been there where we have made promises to the Lord that, Lord, if you will do this, I will do that. And, 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 uh, and in fact, um, I, I'll just share one. I, I won't give you all the details of it, but I'll just share a little bit of one. When, when I was in high school, I, I was lost. When, when I was in high school and... I found myself in a situation that I should not have been, and I was, uh, to give you a little background, just a couple of weeks before this event, 
I had totaled out my vehicle. And so I flipped a car over. Some of you heard me tell that story on a Wednesday night. Uh, it was going almost 90 miles an hour, went over a, a drop-off. The car flew through the air, 89 feet, flipped. I mean, it, it's, it's by the grace of God that I'm here. And, and so I, I, I survived that. And my dad was a little reluctant to let me, allow me to take his car out after that. You could understand why. And, uh, and I found myself on a dirt road, and I had actually pulled off to the side of the road, and, uh, and I almost, two wheels went off the road. And I'm thinking, in two weeks, I'm going to be totaled two cars. I hadn't thought about this story until this week. But, I, but I, as I was asking and praying to the Lord, I, I said, I, I, was, I was just pleading. I, I'd, already, I'd already made up my mind. I was either God was going to answer my prayer or I was running away from home. But I, I, I mean, I, I was just in, in a bad place. And I, and I just promised and, and, and asked the Lord, Lord, if you will get me out of this, then, then I will serve you. I, I, I will go to church. I, I will do whatever you want me to do. Now, I, I don't know that this is um, the answer to that. I, I don't know. Only, only the Lord knows that. But, but what, I, what I do want to say and what I want to emphasize going into this is that the Lord takes very serious our vows. And, and sometimes when we're in a, a situation where we're, we're struggling and, and, uh, and we can't see a way out, Sometimes we're in our immaturity, we are quick to promise things and make vows to the Lord. And I want to discourage you from doing that. I want to discourage you from, from making vows to the Lord unless you have thoughtfully and prayerfully considered what you are vowing to the Lord. As Numbers chapter 30, there's a whole section in Numbers 30 that speaks of our vows and how God views vows. And in vows, he, he takes those things very seriously. And the question for Hannah is, is leaning into this is uh, she's made this vow to the Lord. And so uh, here comes the time. Here's the reality. The baby's in her hand. She, she's rocking this baby. She's looking at this baby. Is she going to keep her word? Is she going to fulfill her promise? Or, or, or perhaps, and I think some of us have been there, maybe she's going to modify it. Maybe she's going to say, you know, I, I know, Lord, I promised that I would give him to you, uh, but he didn't have to go to Shiloh. He, he could stay right here, and, and, and he can serve you right here. Can, can, you, can you hear yourself in that justif justification, justifying things before the Lord? But God knows what her heart was when she made that promise. And Hannah knew what her heart was as well. And so she fulfills her vow. So I want to look at this, just, just a couple of truths that I want to bring out that we can see in Hannah's response, that we see that she was intentional about keeping her promise her vow to the Lord, and some things that we can learn, lessons we can learn from her. Uh, by the way, I, I mentioned Numbers 30 just a moment ago. But let me read verse 2, just as a reminder that if a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. In other words, if you make the promise, then keep the promise. It's important what we vow, what we say before the Lord. And so here we have Hannah, and there's a, a lessons that we can learn from her. And the first one that I, I would have us to notice is there in verse number 21, because she knew what she had promised. She, she intended to carry out her promise and I want you to notice, first of all, that she communicated with her spouse. I know this is very simple, but um, it's not as simple <laughs> as all that. 
She communicated with her spouse. And, and I say that based on verse 21. Her husband, the man Alkanah, uh, went up with all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. So she's, he goes up to, uh, to, Sh- to Shiloh. He, he's going there to, to make his offering. It's the yearly sacrifice. We know this is before the temple. And so uh, this is where the tabernacle would have been located. We've already talked much about that. But he goes and, and notice that it's his vow that he is going to pay. And I say that because he has taken ownership of this vow that Hannah has made. And I say that based on what the Scriptures teach. In fact, in Numbers chapter 30 and verse 13, it is the husband's responsibility to decide that if his wife makes a vow to the Lord, it's up to him to decide whether to keep it or whether to annul it. And so he didn't. He, he has kept this vow. In fact, I, I think he's taken ownership of this vow. And it speaks to them clearly communicating, and, and not just with one another. I think that behind this is that they're praying. They're, they're spending time before the Lord praying about this. I, it, it's, it's a big cost that's involved in giving over this son. I, I, I think about this, and, and probably Barry, who... Um, him and Macy just had this new baby, and can, can you imagine? I mean, God has given you this child. Can you imagine what is in the process of giving this child back? I mean, it's, it's a great cost, and yet we see the, the godliness. We don't talk much about Elkanah in this, but, but what a godly man that, that Elkanah is, that he, he is standing there with his wife and this vow that she's made um, he affirms. So she communicates with him. Uh, secondly, I would just have you to know that she, she demonstrates both wisdom and faithfulness, and that's in verse number 22. Elkanah goes up to make his sacrifice and pay his vow, and there's a contrast there, but, but Hannah did not go up, ready to go up. For she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Now, in our culture, we think about the weaning of a child and and, and whatever age that may be, it's certainly a lot earlier in our day and time than it would have been for the Israelites in uh, 1100 or 1150 B.C. Uh, They didn't have running water. They couldn't go to the sink uh, and, and so it, it would have been common for a child to be nursing up to at least three years old. And, and so it would have been that this child would have been uh, nursed up to three years old and, and probably a little longer than he's weaned, but this is still a, a little fella. This is still a, a, a little boy. But notice that the wisdom that she says, she says, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. And, and the idea is, is uh, as you look at that at first, it, it, it kind of seems like, well, she doesn't want to keep her vow, but, but that's not at what's going on. In fact, I, I think there's great wisdom in how she does this. She, she's, she's probably thinking that if I go up there one time and do not give him to the Lord because he's not yet weaned, it's just going to make it that much more difficult the next time that she goes. I, I don't know all the rationale, but I think there's wisdom in saying that I'm not going to go up there until it's time. And then when it's time, then, then, then I'm going to give him to the Lord. Uh, Kelly and I, right at, when we went to, when God had called me into ministry and I went to Bible college, I went to the Baptist College of Florida and Graceville, and I remember the process of going through that and praying and, and asking the Lord where He would have me to go to school and, and really felt strong about this is where I was going to be. And, and so uh, our kids were teenagers at the time and, and in school, and, and, I, and I was ready to get started. And so I went down, and I actually started school in January, uh, got the house, 
uh, got everything prepared, but because of the school year, Kelly was teaching school and, and the children were still in school. They didn't finish out until June. And, and, and so I would travel back and forth during that time, had the house set up, all the furniture there, everything moved in. But I knew what the house looked like, and she didn't know what the house looked like. And for the record, with three teenagers, it was a 900-square-foot home that was on housing, on, on campus, 900-square-foot tile floors, one bathroom, and it was built in probably the 40s or the 50s. And my, my idea was, I'm not going to let her come down here and see this house until they come down here to, lead, to, to live because I was afraid if she came down on a weekend, she might not ever come back. And so that, that, was, that was the wisdom that I had that when, when, when she leaves, she leaves. And this is the wisdom that Hannah has is that, that when she brings this child to the Lord and dedicates him to the Lord, that she's going to leave this for three and a half, four year old, whatever he may have been, that she's going to leave him. She's dedicating him to the Lord. Great wisdom in this. There's faith in what she does. In fact, we see in verse number 23 that Elkanah, her husband said to her, do what seems best to you. Confirm his word. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. Word. There, there's some speculation about what does this mean when he says only the, uh, the, the Lord confirmed his word. And I think it goes back to the previous section where we see the high priest Eli blessing um, Hannah and, and, and saying, may the God of Israel bless you. And, and, and so I, I think this is, she, she took that by faith that the high priest uh, was confirming that God was going to give her this child. And I think that's what Elkanah is meaning here. May the Lord confirm his word. He has given you this child, and may you in turn give it back. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him, and she did so. And then you see in verse number 24, also her generosity, her, her, her thanksgiving. It, it says that when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a, with a three-year-old, with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Now, this, this is interesting, and if you're reading from the New American Standard, uh, you'll see that it says there that it is a, a three-year-old bull. If you happen to read, read reading from the King James Version, it is three bulls. Now, why the change? And the change is, is that uh, some have thought that it, it, it was just too staggering to be three bulls. In fact, they really point to verse number 25 that then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. That bull is in the singular, and so it had to be one bull that was a three-year-old. But the original, the, the, the older text actually makes it say three bulls. And, and, I, and I really think that that's what it was, that it was three bulls. And I say that because there's a disproportionate offering that she makes. If you were reading the offering... Uh, and they're listed on what they're supposed to, to bring in, in Leviticus. But, but, but it, would, it would appear that what she brings, this uh, one ephah of flour and a jug of wine, is a, to be more than would have been accompanying one bull. In other words, it seems to be that these are three offerings. Why labor so much over this point? Did you understand what is going on with Hannah? Hannah not, not only is not saying to the Lord, well, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to renege on, on what I had vowed to you and promised to you, and, and we're just going to keep Samuel here at home. 
She's not only giving him to the Lord, but, but she comes with a generous offering. She comes with, and we've, we've talked a little bit about Elkanah before, that, that probably he had some money. But, but they are not withholding anything. They're not withholding Samuel, and they're not just saying, well, this is what we promised you, and that's all we're going to give you. No, they come with a, with a huge offering. And then she points out to Eli. She reminds him of who she is. Look at verse 26. She said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. She reminds Eli that she was the one that had came and prayed. And in verse 27, the language that is in verse 27 is almost identical to, the, to, to what she had prayed earlier. She says, for this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition which I asked of him. So, so she uses pretty much the same words that, that were used previously in the, in, the, in the previous section to say that this, this, I believe, by faith, I believe that God has answered my prayer. I was barren, but God has given me this child. And she's fulfilling her vow. And she says in verse 28, so I have also dedicated him to the Lord. Notice how it's worded. I've dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. The word dedicated actually could be translated lent, L-E-N-T. And depending on how it is in the Hebrew, it, it, it's actually Saul in the Hebrew, which could mean the name Saul or could mean Saul as in lent. It's a play on words. Now, we know the rest of the story. We know about King Saul. So, so we, we, we're tipped off at this, and this is kind of a play on words. Let me just read it to you. So I have also Saul to the Lord. As long as he has lived, Saul to the Lord. We'll play with this a little bit more as we go forward. But this is Saul to the Lord. They, they, it, it speaks of them asking. Uh, it's a play on the name of, of, of Samuel. Again, what, what, what she's saying is this is Saul to the Lord. The people later on would ask for Saul. They would ask for a king, and God would give them Saul. But this is Saul to the Lord. They didn't have to ask for a king. God already had a representative for Israel. Somebody that he was, had chosen, somebody that he had uh, given this miraculous birth to. This, this Samuel was uh, dedicated to the Lord. Uh, she's teaching us something about, uh, Hannah's teaching us something about offerings in the sense that, that we understand that God gives it first to us, and whatever He gives us, we give it back to Him. There is nothing that you have that is not and was not first His. It's all His. And, and, and so when we, when we tithe or, or when we make an offering, we're just returning to Him what He has already entrusted to us. There, there's, something, there's something else going on here, and, and, it, and it's really interesting to note. And, and you, can, you can see it behind uh, the, the scene there, and, and that is this, that Hannah is making this, she's fulfilling her vows to the Lord, but, but the, the underlying story that's going on here is that this is Samuel's adoption. What is taking place is Samuel is now becoming Eli's adopted son. And don't miss this. <laughs> In fact, I, I, I can't wait to tell you about it. I mean, I just can't wait to tell you about it because some of you, 
some, some, some of you are already gone, but, 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 but some of the rest of you who are with me right now, I, I'm, tell, I'm telling you, this, 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 is, this is worth being here this morning for. It's the adoption that's taking place. Uh, if you've read ahead and you've kind of read the story, you know, in fact, we see him in the next chapter, you, you, you see that Eli, the high priest, you see his two wicked sons. Now, I want to go back to a point that I made the first week that I was preaching this about Hannah's brokenness and her barrenness. And, and part of that barrenness is, is that she wanted to be a part of the seed of promise. God had, bl- had promised to bless the nations uh, through Abraham, and, and so she, she wants to be a part of that. And, 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 to be, and, and to not have children means that you're excluded from that. You're not a part of that. And yet what we see here, that, that Eli has two wicked sons, and, 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 and God has uh, an adopted son for Eli that he's going to plug in. Not his biological sons, but his adopted son. Some of you are already there with me. Some, and as, as you play out the story, the same thing happens again. You, you see later on that, that Samuel and his sons, that Israel's troubled about Samuel's sons, and so it's not gonna, the seed's not going to come that way, and so, and so they're, they're upset. And, and so they start asking for a king. And so, so, so God brings in Saul. Not going through that biological process, he brings in, it brings in a Saul. And, and then you know that, that Saul has his troubles as well. In fact, as you continue out, you see that, that Saul ends up, and God's plan is not to go through Saul's sons. It wasn't to go through Eli's sons. It wasn't to go through Samuel's sons. And it's not to go through Saul's sons. In fact, he, he brings in a son-in-law, David, and, and he brings the Davidic kingdom through David. And then you see later on, David has problems with his sons as well. Where, where, where are you going with all this? Well, I, I hope I know. I hope I know. There, there, there's, two, there's two immediate things that come to mind. And, and one is, is simply this, is that we, we don't come through the biological line of Israel. We're, we're not Jewish and we're not Israelites, but God in His grace has adopted us as sons. And so, so a part of his plan, just like with Hannah, Hannah recognized that, that she was barren and that, that life comes from God. So it is that God's descendants, those who are adopted by him, understand that it is by God and by his grace that we have life. Well, I feel like I'm, I'm just not getting through. T- turn to Ephesians chapter 2 for just a moment and just, just walk through this real quick with me. You, you see this. Ephesians chapter 2, very familiar passage. Beginning in verse number 1. And you are dead in your trespasses and sins. He's speaking to the Ephesian believers, the, the church at Ephesus, and reminds them that just like Hannah's womb was barren, that we, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. There was life, there was no life. Spiritually speaking, we were lifeless. And in this lifelessness, in this deadness, we uh, walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among the, them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But look at verse 4. But God... Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said, thank God for the buts of the Bible. But God, being rich in mercy, 
because of His great love with which He loved us. Look at everything that's there in verse 4. It's God. It's His, Him being rich in mercy. It's Him, His great love. It's, it, it's His love for us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. So God in His grace gave Hannah life. She had this dead womb, barren womb, and God gave her life. God in His grace has given us who were dead in our trespasses and sins life. And we're to give back what He's given us. We're alive, and, and, and Romans 12 says that we're to be a living sacrifice unto the Lord. How, how much does God want from us? Everything. Everything. Not to withhold anything. And, and, and so, so going back to what I see taking place in this, in this, this line of, of, of sons and, 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 and the, the, the seed of promise... That just as with us, it is spiritual life that we are born uh, not of flesh, but of the Spirit. So it is that this seed of promise uh, would be one not born in a normal way, but would be born by the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary. So our God has been gracious to us and has given us life. And in return, we are to give to Him sacrificially, wholeheartedly, and when we make promises and when we make vows, uh, we should honor them because we will give an account for every word that we say. Have you ever thought about that? I think about it every Sunday morning. We will give an account for every word we say. So be careful what you promise. And whatever you promise, by the grace of God, fulfill your vows. Will you stand with me for prayer? As I'm praying, I'm going to ask our deacons and wives to, to come forward. If there's a matter that we can pray with you about. But I, I would ask in these moments uh, for God to search your heart and, and see if there is an unfulfilled vow that you've not made. I, I want to mention this just in closing as well. Have you, men and women who are married, have you taken the time to go back and look at the vows that you have promised to one another? Have you done that? It's been my experience that some people are not even aware of what they have vowed, but yet God is. Father in heaven, 
Help us, O oh Lord, to be people who are people of truth. And help us, O oh Lord, to be a people that can say, let our yes be yes and our no be no. And Lord, I pray that if there are areas that we have failed to fulfill our vows, Lord, that we would either do what we can to do so. But if we are not able, I pray, Lord, that we would truly repent and trust in the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.